Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Benjamin. I will be your host for today's forum webinar. I have attended a forum only this year and last year, but I confess there were such a good opportunities for my encouragement and growth and further for the ministry. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to briefly highlight the organization that I worked for. The Forum of Christian Leaders is a sponsor of European Leadership Forum as well as today's webinar. If you are enjoying the webinar today, you should consider attending the European Leadership Forum. There will be over 300 seminars like this webinar during the forum. Our speaker today, Peter, Peter Sanders, has been a speaker for the forum along with 140 others evangelical thinkers and leaders. The forum is an in-person conference in Poland. You can find the link to register for the European Leadership Forum at europeanleadership.org. You should also take a moment to check our folkonline.org. That is where you can find access to a multiple of free resources, just like this webinar. Now, I want to briefly introduce our speaker. Peter Saunders. Peter was born in New Zealand and originally trained as a general surgeon before serving with the Africa Island Mission in Kenya and completing two years of mission training at All Nation Christian College in the UK. From 1992 to 2018, he served full-time with Christian Medical Fellowship, a UK-based organization with 4,500 UK doctor, doctors and 1,000 medical students as members, first as head of student ministry and from 1999 as chief executive. From 2006 to 2018, he also served as a campaign director of the Care Not Killing Alliance, a coalition of over 40 organizations in the UK promoting palliative care and opposing euthanasia. Since January 2019, he has been CEO of the ICMDA, International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together national association of doctors and dentists in over 80 countries worldwide. His work has involved leadership training, teaching evangelism, and ethics, medical mission, writing, editing, and media work. His wife, Kirsty, is retired community pediatrician, and they have three sons, Christopher, Benjamin, and Jonathan, and two grandchildren. They are a member of Spicer Street Church, St. Albans. Let's us welcome Peter. Peter, you're welcome, and you can um, start your presentation. Well, thanks very much, Benjamin, for your warm welcome and introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I, wherever you're listening from, I hope we can have some good time together thinking about the whole uh, thing about building a strong team so crucial to, to leadership. Uh, one little addition to the introduction is that uh, as of last week, we have three grandchildren. So we're really praising the Lord for the addition to our family. So my background, as you've heard, was in, in general surgery initially, then a medical mission work, and then really for the last uh, 35 years almost, I've been in Christian leadership roles, working initially with the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK, and then more recently with the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together doctors and dentists from all over the world in over 100 countries. Uh, at the moment and I, I really thank God for the involvement that I've had with the European Leadership Forum over many years. It's been a great encouragement to me uh, personally, made many good friends and, and learned many, many good things. And uh, so we're looking tonight at the whole issue of building a, a strong team in a, in a Christian context. And there are so many good books on Christian leadership, uh, good uh, podcasts you can listen to, videos you can see, and, and so on. And what I'm saying tonight isn't anything uh, new. It's really quite basic. But 
I wanted just to encourage you, first of all, that the Bible is an extraordinary resource of leadership material. And of course, Paul, as Paul tells Timothy, God's uh, word is uh, expired or inspired by him, being breathed out by him for teaching, rebuke, correcting and training in righteousness. And uh, as he says to the Corinthians, uh, when he talks about the Old Testament examples and he gives uh, four examples of how the Israelite people went wrong, falling into idolatry, to sexual immorality, to complaining, to uh, doubting that God was with them in 1 Corinthians 10. And then he goes on to say these things happened as warnings to us. And the whole of the Bible and, and especially also the Old Testament is just a wealth of uh, information and teaching about uh, leadership, uh, both good and bad. And uh, particularly the, the narratives, the stories illustrate so many important principles. And we can do a lot worse than uh, studying the great examples of team builders in the scripture. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, most of all, but also the, the great leaders that we see, Moses, David, Solomon, Nehemiah, Paul, and uh, some good examples that will make references to those as we go through. So what I'm wanting to bring you tonight is just is seven points about, uh, about building a strong team. And uh, the first one is be clear on your vision, mission, and strategy. Uh, if you're not clear on it, then those who are work walking with you and following you will not be clear. Very clear understanding of what your, your goals are. Think of, of Jesus giving the Great Commission to those 12 men. That was his plan for evangelizing the whole world, was to invest in those 12 people. And in the Great Commission, he, he spelled it out very clearly, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, of course, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. It was very, very clear. When uh, Paul talks about his own mission, he says his ambition was always to preach the gospel where it was not known in Romans 15. And so we need to know our vision very clearly, and we need to communicate it clearly and frequently so that people really understand what we're there for. Otherwise, our teams will not have focus. Nehemiah, when he went back to Jerusalem and saw it in ruins and or, or heard uh, news of it and was in tears before the Lord and, and asked for help, he then went out and spent uh, a lot of time looking around, seeing what needed to be done. But then he called people together and he communicated his vision very clearly and frequently and uh, so people were able to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem in just 50 days and uh, when you have uh, a vision uh, and a mission unless it is a very very small one there is no question that you're going to need a strong team to help you achieve it because uh, you cannot uh, do it alone Stephen Covey's book is uh, very popular, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But uh, one of these habits is this, begin with the end in mind. Know exactly where you're going, because leadership is all about leading people from where they are now to where you want them to go. And within the ICMDA, uh, we, we try to keep things very, very simple. We have a, uh, we have a logo, which is about uh, Christ's cross, which we're called to carry. The, the labor, the bowl with which we serve one another and wash one another's feet. But our, our mission, is, our vision is very clear. The vision is, is what you will see when your work is done. That's what a vision is about. And so our vision is a Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and in every nation. And that's what everybody in the team is working towards. The mission is how you achieve your vision. Our mission is to start and to strengthen national movements of Christian doctors and dentists. There are over uh, 100 of them currently affiliated with ICMDA. And so whenever we uh, make plans, form strategies and so on, we're always asking ourselves, uh, does this serve the mission of starting and strengthening national movements in order to achieve 
the vision of a Christian witness through doctors and dentists. So think about your own situation. Can you crystallize in one short sentence what your vision is and what your mission is? Because if you can't and you're not clear on it, then members of your team will not be either. And then out of the vision and mission come the strategies. And, and our core strategy is about to train, mentor, and develop Christian medical and dental leaders because we believe that's the way of uh, producing, starting, and strengthening national movements. So it's very, very simple, clear, and easily communicated. And this is the, the pyramid of, uh, of uh, strategic planning, if you like. And right at the apex is the vision, what you want to be, what will be the outcome of your mission when you've finished it, the mission, what, what is your core purpose, your values, your culture and beliefs, not, not just Christian values, although all based on Christian principles, but you should be able to describe the values, what makes your organization uh, unique in terms of the five or six things that it really stands for. And then out of that comes specific goals and uh, strategies and initiatives which, which serve it. So number two, uh, play to your personal strengths. Uh, can you imagine an orchestra where you gave the violin to the tuba player, the tuba to the double bass player, the double bass to the, uh, to the flute player and so on, it would be a complete disaster, wouldn't it? Or imagine a sports team where you put the forwards in the back and the, and the backs and the forwards and swapped around all the positions. So uh, a team is made up of people who are suited to a particular role, which matches their strengths and the gifts that God has given to them. And as a leader, all leaders are different. And it's incredibly important that we recognize what our strengths are and play to those. And there are lots of really good resources now to help us to understand the kind of people we are in terms of our personalities and giftings and where we're really strong. And uh, the best teams are those that have people who are uh, especially suited for each position, the best person in that position uh, in the team. It's all about, if you like, getting the right people on the bus, first of all, and then putting each of those people in the right position. Because a team is a a team is a team, not a family. It's very important to make that distinction. And then uh, in your leadership, focus on your own personal calling. So Paul described this. He said, I've always made it my ambition to preach the gospel where it was not known before, Romans 15. Uh, or Philippians 3, where he talks about striving forward to what uh, lies ahead uh, or acts 20 where he says i do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only i may accomplish my course to testify to the glory of the gospel of christ and so it's very clear on what his calling was uh, and be constantly learning and developing the importance of reading and skills studying uh, good leaders learning from them i was talking to one of the leaders in our, our network today and uh, he, he had just received some uh, quite strong criticism from uh, someone in another organization. And I was asking him how, how he felt about this. And, and he said, he said, everything I, I hear uh, helps me get stronger because it recognizes areas of weakness. And so my attitude, he said, is always to help me be better at the job that I'm doing. And so as we need both to understand our own personal strengths, also we need to, to surround ourselves with people who are strong in the areas where we are weak. We cannot do everything. We do not have all gifts. All of us are very limited. And the best leaders are those who surround themselves with those who are strong in areas where they're weak. So just a couple of examples. This is the, the Myers-Briggs. You, you may well be familiar with this. You can do a, a questionnaire and it will tell you which of these 16 categories of people you are. And what's very interesting is that out of these 16 categories of people, about 90% of people in leadership roles come from just five of those 
categories. So there's a specific personality type that is suited to a leadership position rather than being someone in uh, the team. Uh, do you know your, your type and what the strengths and weaknesses of that type are? And then uh, this, this one I've just mentioning too, but I think Strengths Finder is, is very helpful. Uh, again, you can do the survey online. You may have to pay to, to do it. Or if you buy the book, you'll get a free number in the back to be able to do it. And uh, this will uh, give you an analysis of where your strengths are out of 37 different strengths. Some of them are personality traits. Some of them are abilities. Some of them are character qualities. And knowing what your top five are really helps to define very clearly what the role is or what the kind of leader you are is and therefore where your deficiencies are. I've just highlighted the ones that that uh, came up for me and they uh, knowing these has really helped me to be uh, to find the right position for myself. So number three, uh, be accountable. Uh, we talked about surrounding yourself with strong leaders, but particularly people who love you so much that they are prepared to say the things that uh, you perhaps don't like hearing. Uh, don't surround yourself with yes men, but but surround yourself with people who will really uh, challenge you. And uh, Paul gives uh, in Second Timothy a list of the people he travelled around with. Paul was always uh, never a solo agent. He was always working with others in in teams, and they helped him to to be better. Build an effective top team. Uh, in uh, Second Samuel 8, we see David's top team listed. There are about six people there, all of whom had key roles when David was king. And then in, in uh, chapter 23 of Second Samuel, we have David's mighty men, about 30 people who he uh, called onto his team. Build an effective uh, top team. Matthew 17, of course, is the transfiguration. Jesus had a top team. He had the 12 who he called, but within that 12 were three people in whom he invested a hugely disproportionate amount of his time, Peter, James, and John, who went with him when the others didn't. And in leadership, we're going to have concentric circles of people, those who are very, very close to us, who get a disproportionate amount of our time, and then uh, concentric circles going out as Jesus had the three, then the 12 and the 70, and then there were others with whom he had life-changing encounters in the same way. We cannot be uh, the same to everybody because we're limited in time and space. Uh, taking painful rebukes from critical friends. One of the things that really made Moses was after he had been successful with Pharaoh, led the people out of Egypt, took them into the wilderness, his, uh, his wife's father came to see him, Jethro. And Jethro was amazed at what had been achieved through uh, Moses. He wanted to hear the story of everything they'd done, but then he sat down and watched him and he gave him some absolutely life-changing advice about delegation and appointing leaders, which, which uh, absolutely transformed Moses's life from that uh, point on. Second Timothy 12 is the story of Nathan rebuking David over Bathsheba. Uh, Proverbs 27 talks about the wounds of a friend being painful, but actually producing life in us. So being accountable. And, and part of that is, is about being open about your struggles. One of my favorite books in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians, because Paul is so open about all the difficulties that he faced and how hard he found it. And uh, we need to be we need to be vulnerable and willing to share, and uh, particularly where we're try, trying to encourage people to develop in areas where they're struggling to be able to share how we have struggled in the same areas, so that they see leadership as something that is that is attainable. That God uses broken people, people who are are weak, because His strength is made perfect in in weakness. So uh, your senior team can't be too big. We have we have six in ours. This is a, a global team. So uh, one of these, uh, two of these guys are from Africa. Uh, two 
one from Asia, one from Latin America. And then there's myself and my executive assistant, Josh. We're both actually originally from New Zealand, but we live in the UK. So, uh, and this, this team, we get together regularly to share, to pray for each other, to do our planning. And uh, whenever we're planning an event or a new initiative, someone has an idea, we always run it by the rest of the team to, to hone it. And it's in the friction of those team meetings that things are perfected. My grandfather was a keen collector of, of uh, gemstones, and he used to go out and collect uh, rocks from off the beach that he thought had potential, and he'd put them in a, in a barrel which he would roll around and around and around with, with sand and grit thrown in, and they would rub uh, against each other. And when he took it, opened it up after several days, he would see that all of these stones were beautifully polished. And it's it's the friction within a team between members, the it, the the disagreements, the the creativity working together that helps you to produce a far better result than you ever could uh, your yourself. And uh, accountability is all about preventing the fall from grace because often the initial signs are very very subtle, and it's uh, generally when people become unapproachable, uh, where they're unable to listen to criticism, where they think they have everything they need without the team, where they don't recognize their dependence on everyone else in the body of Christ. A great book by Marcus Honeysett, good friend of mine on powerful leaders, but we want to avoid becoming casualties. And one of the best ways of doing it is to build accountability. I love this quote from Margaret Thatcher. You might uh, have different views about Thatcher. She was the Prime Minister of the UK for uh, many years back in the 1990s. But uh, she says this, watch your thoughts because they become words. Watch your words for beca they become actions. Watch your actions for they become habits. Watch your habits for they become character. Watch your character for it becomes your destiny. And uh, the greatest challenge of leadership is leading oneself first of all. So at number four, and we're halfway through now, but uh, select and position. You're putting together a team. You want to choose the people who are best suited to, the, to being on the team, who share the vision, the mission, and uh, uh, are really committed to the, uh, the strategies but you also need to get them in the right places that match their particular gifts. And so fundamental to this is, is praying that God will continually raise up workers. When Jesus said, look, the fields are white for harvest, he didn't say to his 12 disciples, therefore, because there's only 12 of you, you've all got to work much, much harder. Now he said the first thing to do is to pray that God will raise up workers. It's all about multiplication. And uh, leaders uh, will often get into trouble because they make bad selections and put people on their teams who either don't uh, buy into the vision, the mission and the values, or who alternatively are put in the wrong place that doesn't match their gifts. We talk about the seven C's of selection, but it's far better to make the right selections than uh, to try and uh, deal with a problem where you've taken someone on who really does not uh, gel with the rest of the team or share the vision or is in the wrong place. And of course, uh, we often don't know how people are going to um, to work out. The seven C's can, can uh, help us. We can maybe talk about those in, in questions later. But one of the best ways of finding out what a person is capable of is to, is to take someone who is faithful, in other words, uh, you know, you give them a job, they do it, and give them things to do that you think might be beyond them, just to test them. And you will get some amazing surprises. You, you, you will be surprised how some people flounder, but you will be even more astounded by the way that just giving a person a job to do that you think is beyond them uh, causes them to stretch and grow into that position. We've had some wonderful examples of that within ICMDA, when people who were relatively untested but had proved themselves faithful were given 
a bigger job and then it grew and developed and they moved into a position of leadership. And that's about, of course, recognizing people's specific gifts and encouraging them in those. There's all those passages that list, list the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, but trying to understand a person's background, experience, personality, what they're good at, and putting them in a position that really helps them to use those gifts and taking time to select the best people for the key roles. It's far better to wait for the right person than it is to put someone into a role for which they're not suited and then be stuck with the difficulty of trying to deal with that problem. And Mark 3 is where Jesus went up and spent the whole night praying and then selected the 12, didn't he? He, he, uh, he chose them out. Exodus 31, 35 and 37 talk about a particular person that Moses had on his team called uh, Bezalel. Uh, he had a friend called Aholiab. And First uh, Kings talks about someone similar that Solomon had called uh, Huramabi, who was from uh, what we now know as Lebanon. And uh, these people had specific gifts. Uh, what they ended up doing was all the fine, intricate work in the tabernacle and then later in the in the temple itself. And there was really no one else in Israel who could do what Bezalel and Aholiab did. They were, they were really gifted uh, craftsmen. There was no one in Israel who could do what Hiramabi did. He had to come from another country. But once he was in that role, he did it to perfection. So look for people who are extraordinarily gifted in an area, particularly where you're weak and where you need skills in the in the job and, and get them into the right positions. So select them uh, and position them. Now, uh, you've got to be clear on the structure of your own organization and its sphere. We, we, we are the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, so we're involved over all of the world. And we divide the world up into 14 regions uh, on the basis of languages and cultures and, and geopolitical uh, features as well. You can see them all here. And then each one of those regions has a leader. It's a nice, uh, uh, nice number, 14. So we have a regional secretary for each of those. And it's that regional secretary's job to build a team of uh, field workers who cover uh, part or uh, a region of their, of their uh, or sub-region of their region and who have specific roles to play within the team. So here's just uh, one example. I think that this is our Francophone African uh, region. The map's a little bit out of date because the green countries are those which are members of ICMDA and it's almost all green now. So quick and rapid and, and uh, blessed is the growth that's taking part in this region. But uh, in this region, we have a regional secretary, uh, Jean-Paul here, and he has a team of field workers around him, uh, all people with specific gifts who are responsible for different countries in the team with defined uh, roles. Uh, number five, empower and develop. Make developing people your key priority. If we look at Paul's letters, we see in many of them right at the end, there is a list of names of people who Paul is greeting. And the longest list that we find is at the end of Romans. Romans 16 is full of uh, people's names, uh, over 20 people. And Paul uh, addresses each of these people by name, sends them his, his greetings. Uh, he knows about them, what they do. And what's amazing about that is that when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he had never actually visited Rome. And so these 20 plus people living in Rome were people he'd met on his travels in other places. And yet he knew their names, uh, what they did, what their gifts were, and he made developing them his priority. So to pray for them, uh, to uh, give them roles that were really gonna help them to fly and, and grow. And uh, part of that is recognizing the training and support that your people need. And um, within ICMDA, we are, are there to serve uh, as, it, as it is 107 national movements, 
uh, with altogether probably 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists throughout them. But our team of, of 70 field workers arranged in regions are actually our key priority in the training. So it's not that we are just using these folk to train others. Of course, they do that. But it's their own spiritual uh, welfare and growth that is the focus. And so when we run uh, training programs and develop people, it's always our field workers that we're thinking of first. And uh, people in your team, uh, building them up and helping them to become what God wants them to be it must be your key priority as a leader, which means encouragement, stirring up, but particularly speaking well of them and especially speaking well of them, both when they are there and when they are not there as well. Um, I, I'm not saying don't be critical, but don't be critical of people publicly, except in very rare circumstances. Save the criticism and, and the constructive suggestions for uh, you know one-to-ones and small group meetings and so on, uh, generally one-to-ones. But um, when you're speaking of your team, speak well of them uh, publicly and uh, delegate to increase the work. Uh, we have a saying in the Christian Medical Fellowship, do what only you can do. In other words, don't do things that other people can do. If someone can do something 70 or 80% as well as you, then it's probably them who should be doing it and not you, so that you can then relieve yourself of that task and move on to other things. And an effective leader will have a changing job description every year of his or her life because uh, every year he or she will be identifying people to do part of the role they were once doing and handing it on to them why so that they can then free themselves up so just as Moses was able to free himself up from solving every problem that there was in Israel which he didn't have the capacity to do he appointed uh, leaders and he dealt them with only the most difficult problems that were sent through to him in the same way the apostles had this problem with the the widows uh, wanting to be cared for being neglected in the daily distribution and so they uh, appointed these seven uh, deacons if you like of whom Stephen and Philip were among that number because uh, they recognized the important priority of teaching the word and praying and so uh, always be seeking to uh, pass on what you're doing to to others and uh, Sometimes the challenge is that we love doing something so much that we would rather just keep doing it ourselves. But uh, a, a, an effective leader will always be willing to move into a position of uh, new challenge, doing things that he or she hasn't done before in order that others can fill the gaps that he or she has uh, emptied. And uh, delight in seeing others succeed. John the Baptist, remember, I must decrease and he must increase he said of jesus <laughs> and when some someone on your team you realize is actually uh, much better than you are at something or has insights that you don't have uh, or, or is taking on tasks that you once did that's not uh, a reason to be upset but it's a, a reason to to rejoice because uh, uh being able to see them succeed and the very best teams it's players get uh, in the sports team for example the, the player who gets a delight from giving the pass that puts another person in space to score is uh, what the kind of people that we need to be and so it's uh, crucially important that we work on our uh, personal relationships that we uh, build good relationships with people that we gently persuade we don't argue argue that we're not um creating friction but are gently leading by example so uh, this is just again an example what we have we have these eight different training tracks they're all 10-week courses uh, which people do three hours commitment per week into things like evangelism apologetics uh, bioethics servant leadership and uh, so on and uh we, we started running these in COVID. We've, we've run about 130 10 week courses now, had over a thousand people go through them. But the first people that we introduced to these were actually our own field workers who then 
became leaders and facilitators of others. So seeking to build up your own team. Uh, number six, we're nearly there now. So build good systems. Be clear on your organizational structure, what the, the role is of each person in the organization, how they relate to each other, who is accountable to two, uh, to who. And um, build good systems, whether it's a financial system, a database, a, a program for, uh, for teaching, um, whatever it is, build good systems. And in order to build good systems, you need good people. In an organization where the systems are not working, usually the problem is that the wrong people or untrained people uh, have the responsibility of running those systems. But, but good people will create good systems. Uh, organize your team. Solomon's uh, example in First Kings 4, where, where he uh, set up regional directors for uh, each of the, the regions within Israel, gave them specific jobs to do. We see Jesus doing the same thing in Luke 9 and 10, where he sends his disciples out and plan uh, carefully for, for major for major projects, including financial planning. Think of Nehemiah. Uh, he saw the wall in ruins. He knew that it was way, way beyond his individual capacity to do anything about. He needed to have a plan. So he formulated that, called people together, and then he uh, did the planning right from the beginning where he recognized he needed resources and had to ask the king of Persia for help in putting them together. So an effective organization has uh, governance, first of all, a, a board, a group of people who are there to, to rule or to govern, to set the budget and the strategy, to agree the policies, to uh, oversee the finances and employ the leader or the, the CEO. So within ICMDA, I have a, a board of 15 people to whom I'm answerable. They set me very broad parameters each year, but I cannot cross those uh, boundaries i have to fulfill the plans that i'm i'm given but within that i have a huge amount of um uh, influence and and authority uh staff and volunteers the only difference between the two is that one group are paid and the others aren't and are usually part-time um and but all of them have specific roles to do uh, a clear structure of accountability so that as I say, everybody knows who's accountable to who and so on, who appoints, who appraises, who uh, um, you know, brings a, an employment to an end. Systems for communication, training events, and then uh, most important, uh, communications. You uh, really need a really good communication system. Uh, one of the things I... I uh, make a point of doing is every every single month I'm writing a newsletter, not particularly long, usually less than a thousand words, always with eight uh, items in it, where I'm trying to highlight the major messages and things about the direction of the of the fellowship, and particularly in a crisis, in uh, situations like we've just been through with with uh, COVID, the 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 most important thing. Uh, first of all, is to get your top team together to understand what the messages are and then clearly communicate how people are to move forward. So just uh, some examples of, of systems. We uh, This is a system called Expense Plus, which is a, a very cheap online accounting software, which absolutely revolutionized the running of our organization. Uh, look, look for good models like this. When I took the job with, with uh, ICMDA, we had a, a website that was in great need of repair. I knew I did not have the ability to do it, but I had a right-hand man who, who did, but we needed to find out what uh, systems to use. And I went to one, our strongest national movement in the US and I spent a couple of hours with their head of IT there. And I said, you know, what's, what is the, um, what's the, uh, content management system we we need and uh, what what would be the plugins and and he just he gave me two words then he said wordpress and a plugin called beaver builder will do everything and so i went back and said wordpress and beaver builder and uh, our 
guy uh, got those things and we've never looked back ever since. If you have the right systems and particularly those that are, are free, that the Slack system we've found very good for online discussion, but look out for systems that people have developed that, that have proved themselves. Find out what other organizations do. You can save yourself so much trouble. And then finally, um, mitigate against relationship failure. In other words, try to prevent relationship problems happening. And uh, when a team crisis emerges with uh, a falling out with an individual, a breakdown of a relationship between two of your team, then you need to act quickly. And that was perhaps one of the mistakes that, that David made is that when when Absalom went AWOL after murdering Amnon, uh, after, of course, David's unfaithfulness with Bathsheba, I'm sure it was all traced back to that. But David did not deal with the problem. And what was uh, initially an abscess in his relationship grew until he nearly lost everything because of it. And when there are crises in a team, we need to drop everything and attend to them and mend those relationships, uh, remembering to the importance of staying accountable ourselves. If we don't listen to and receive criticism, then other people are not going to receive it from us. Uh, not to get frustrated with the team. That was one of Moses's problems. He got frustrated with the people of Israel, ended up uh, striking the rock with his staff rather than just speaking to it as God had told him because he was frustrated with his team. As a result, he wasn't able to lead the people into the promised land. It was Joshua who took that. Don't be jealous of your team members. Rather, uh, be delighted that God has given them gifts which he hasn't given you and be delighted that they can therefore do things which you no longer have to do. If you can uh, be always passing things on, it's a great thing in growing the team. Uh, don't uh, fail to invest in key relationships. We've talked about that with David and, and Absalom. Don't be too hard a taskmaster. Be uh, gentle with people. One of the mistakes that, that Rehoboam made, remember he said to the people in the north of Israel, my, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Uh, in other words, you thought he was bad. I'm going to be even tougher than he is. No, uh, be like David, the, the vulnerable uh, leader who uh, led by example, but uh, who uh, everyone wanted to follow because he was gentle with following. And, and remember that when relationships do break down, it's not the end. The uh, story of Paul and Barnabas having such a sharp disagreement, we're told that they parted company over, over, over Timothy sorry, over Mark. Uh, and then, uh, but later we we learned that, that Mark was very useful to Paul and there was uh, redemption again and, and reconciliation in that relationship. But it may be that when a relationship breaks down, it may be some time before it can be put back together again. But relationship breakdown is not the end and God always has a purpose in it. So uh, I'm going to uh, stop the sharing now. We've got about 15 minutes or so for questions. Karen Patterson is certainly awake and she said, should we appoint people or advertise a position and interview? What is the correct procedure in this day and age of PC and uh, fair recruitment? Well, I, I think it does uh, depend to some extent uh, on the situation that you're in and the, the country that you are in. But, and there are certainly situations where uh, it is right to go out and advertise uh, or to put together a, a short list and explore it and uh, take out of that, you know, a small number of people, maybe three or four to go for an interview and you can find many good people that way. But uh, there are also, I think there's a lot to be said for just you know praying that God would raise the right people up. And many of those people who uh, are going to uh, move into positions of influence in your organization and take more senior roles are people you already 
No. So look for people who are already somewhere in your network, who, who really get the vision, who've demonstrated faithfulness, who understand the mission and who respond and, uh, you know, uh, look there first of all. So I think it's, it's both, both and really. Um, if you have people in the wrong position, how do you manage that? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And as I said, uh, prevention is better than cure. So it, it's best to take real time in selection. And if you have real doubt about someone, uh, not to go ahead and appoint them into a role where uh, you may be wishing months later that um, you hadn't because you've got a much more difficult job of moving them on. But I think if you've got someone who is really not performing in a role uh, because uh, either because of relationship failure or character issues or whatever, or, or simply because they don't have the relevant gifts or they, they are gifted but they're not teachable or whatever, then it's it's not good for them and it's not good for you either or for your organization to have them carrying uh, on in that role. So I, I think, of course, we must give people a good trial period to see, but when you make a new appointment, it's always important to have an initial trial period at the end of which you can evaluate and it will become uh, it will become very clear whether they're going to be a person who grows and develops um, it, it may be that they are in your organization but just in the wrong position and that there is a better position for them that better matches their gifts and that you discover that uh, eventually um, i think it depends on the situation after developing our mission, vision, and goals, Jeremiah says, what are some tangible ways we can pass them on to our team? Well, I think it always be talking about them in your, all your communications. I think probably my own team get tired of me going on and on and on about this is our vision, this is our mission, this is our focus. But actually, after a while, people really do get it and understand and you'll see how dramatically it changes the way that they function and also it helps people who are not really suited to the team to recognize that they're that they're not um you know that they haven't got a future in that in that particular team and and to go where uh, somewhere where it might be um much more effective for them to be be working i talked about this the seven c's let me just run through what those are, um, and these are questions I always ask myself before making any new appointment or moving a person to a new position. And the first C is, is their Christian testimony. Are, are they someone who is a genuine converted believer growing in Christ who has a testimony of, of growth, who loves the Lord and wants to serve him first of all, not number one. The second issue is, is character. Uh, are they a person who is reliable, who's trustworthy, who godly, who sh is showing the fruit of the spirit in increasing measure as they grow, who, who, is, who is humble. Character is far more important than giftedness. And a person of character uh, will be more effective after time than a person uh, who, who is greatly gifted but does not have character. And uh, it's character that's more often the, the cause of a downfall of a leader. Uh, the third C is charismata, which is uh, the biblical Greek word, of course, meaning gift, giftedness. So it's about abilities. Do they have the abilities, the natural gifts, the learned skills that suit the particular role for which you're calling them? Uh, the next uh, C is, is coachability. In other words, are they correctable? Will they take criticism? Uh, or do they get angry and resentful when you point things out? Uh, are they rather humble? Like the, the uh, example I gave earlier today of the guy who said, I just want help to get better, and I don't mind from where it comes or even what spirit it comes in. So coachability. One of my favorite interview questions when uh, I'm considering taking someone on is to ask them, describe uh, a mistake that you made in your previous job and what you learned from it. And it's a very revealing question because some people, they just go blank and, and, and they can't think 
of any mistake they ever made. Well, I, I would suggest you probably don't want people like that on your team. Other people will, will point out a mistake, but then give all sorts of excuses as to why it wasn't their fault and why it was somebody else's fault. But the people you're looking for are those who describe the mistake and have a full insight and understanding about what they did wrong and what they could do better from it and how they changed their behavior as a result. Those are the kind of people that you want on your team. So the fifth C is culture. Do they fit in the culture of your organization? Now, so you might may have someone who has a wonderful Christian testimony. They've got great character, they're, they're gifted, they're coachable, but they just don't get your vision, mission, and uh, values. It, it doesn't make their heart sing. Uh, they're not uh, part of the culture. They don't fit with the people. Well, they're far better off in another organization or another church. And if the, the sixth one is chemistry. So that's all about how we get on with them. Can, do we do we have a good relationship with them? You know, can we can we joke with them? And enjoy good times and hard times. Really enjoy being with each other, that's uh, important. And then the final one is uh, commitment. Is there that that drive and that passion and real commitment to the, uh, the aligned uh, vision and mission and values of your uh, organization? Now, I'm not saying if you apply these seven criteria that you will make a perfect choice all the time because we all make mistakes. You don't really know what a person is like until they're in your organization and working and then you, you see what they're capable of, but but uh, th I've found these seven questions have been really helpful in um, at least uh, making more many more good choices than bad choices. So, um, how close is a leader to the team? What limits, if 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 any? Well, I I think it it is the balance. If if you are the leader of the team, you are the one who is finally accountable, responsible, and has authority in the way that other members of the team uh, do not. And so it, it's not a democracy where everybody has, you know, an equal uh, say. The, the leader, of course, has to listen to all the suggestions, uh, have good relationships with the team, have his ears and eyes and heart open all the time, but be uh, but be aware when is the time to consult and then when is the time to command, consult and command, make a decision, make the direction clear, having listened and point the way forward. <laughs> and in terms of, of limits, yes, I think as in all of our relationships, we have relationships which are much more close and intimate where we would share things that we wouldn't share with others. And I think that's true in a team as well. So it's important to, to um, you know, be sure who you're uh, sharing uh, things with and, and keep those concentric circles, if you like, of, of uh, intimacy and relationship in the way that we see Jesus uh, modeling him. Uh, the, the people who were the three or the 12 or the 70 and so on uh, got more of his time uh, and, and energy and focus. Another question here, should leadership positions at all levels be for specific terms, how to encourage responsibility without micromanaging? Well, uh, there's two questions there. I think it's really good to have specific terms because at the end of a term, then you can raise the question and have a discussion with the person about uh, you know, how it's gone, evaluate it and, and decide wh whether it's a relationship you want to renew. And there will be people who come onto your team for a relatively short period of time, uh, benefit from it, hopefully, and then move on to other things with another team. And so uh, we should rejoice in seeing that God has given us a role in helping to develop that person for perhaps a role that won't be with us longer term. But uh, within ICMDA, we have we have terms for every, everything. So our regional secretaries are four-year appointments, our, regional reps and area reps of two-year appointments, uh, leaders of uh, trainers are generally two-year appointments. People come on the board for, for four years. But uh, all of these are 
renewable after that time, but it's very important to have uh, a, a short period at the beginning, usually about six months or so, where you assess how it's going, but then a defined period whereby you can then ask, ask the question, how to encourage responsibility without micromanaging? Well, I think we micromanage when we don't trust people. And uh, so if you're feeling you're being drawn into micromanaging a person, you need to ask uh, why you're, you're doing that, what specific training they need is it an attitude problem or is it a training issue or are they perhaps in the wrong role but it's extremely important to uh, always be asking this question what is it that only I can do and what am I doing now that could be passed on to others or what is it that actually other members of my team can do better or as I said before if they do it just 70 or 80 percent as well as you then it's probably them who should be doing it not you so that you can move on to something else oh uh this i've got to be careful here because the <laughs> chap asking this question is one of my board members and he's asking me in your experience is it easier to manage a team of volunteers or a team of employees ah uh, that's an interesting question i think that the major difference between volunteers and employees is that one group you pay and the other group you don't. But with in terms of other respects, the quality of work you expect from them, the commitment, the 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 need for a job description, you know, a, a fixed term, careful selection, making sure that they're in the right position of the organization in a role that really matches their gifts. I think uh, those questions are pretty much the same for volunteers and for employees. It's, it's um, it, because an employee is generally working with you full-time or, or a, a considerable part-time, you're spending a lot more time with them. So that creates a difficulty in dynamics. But I think, uh, I think what, whereas each has its challenges, uh, I think that it, it's incredibly important that with uh, with both, uh, we have a high bar and we have good expectations, a clear description of roles, and that we put them in the right position and, and treat them with with respect and look to develop them. And we, we really see our, our volunteers uh, and the different levels of experience they have as a great training job so or training ground. So the training systems that we're doing, uh, as well as offering ways in which people can develop, we're looking out for, for talent and people who have potential to go on beyond it. And in God's economy, of course, the reward for work well done is uh, more work to do. So if you see a person that's doing a role very well, then uh, that's the person who you should look to offer something uh, beyond what they're doing and seeing how they cope with that and 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 grow. So volunteers can become uh, uh, higher level volunteers. Uh, they can become part time employees. They can become full time employees. So create that kind of funnel where you're working with a very large number of people given defined roles to do and watch them and see how they perform in those and then reward um, people who are performing well with more responsibility. It's the stewardship principle. Uh, how and where would we look for a mentor to help us as leaders? I, I think uh, there are lots of places. I, I think first of all, peer groups, and I've been in a CEO position for, um, well, over 30 years, uh, no, so over 20 years now in two different organizations. And uh, as a CEO, you're in a unique kind of position. You're, you're not on the board. You're not uh, a department head or uh, a manager. You're the only one in the organization. And it can be, if you're not careful, it can be quite a lonely position. You can feel sometimes that other people don't really understand the unique pressures that you're you're facing. And so what I found incredibly important was to build up a peer group of CEOs uh, through the CEO 
uh, conferences that were run, other people doing the same roles who understood the position I was doing. Or if you're in a, a middle management position to find other people in other organizations who are doing those, a peer group. Uh, latch on to good leaders I uh, or leadership uh, trainers, if you like. I have a small group of people that I, I really rate, whose books I, I read, I, who I devour their podcasts and their videos and their, and their writings, and I'm always learning uh, from them. And uh, also, uh, if, I, I think it's important to have people uh, who are not part of the fabric of your organization in a, in a position either as your employees or in authority over you as a board or, or whatever, who, are, who love the organization, but who are not actually directly part of it so that you can uh, you can have a different kind of relationship with people like that i think also there are different kinds of uh of uh of helping the my uh my brother who's just a little bit younger than me lives in new zealand and has had a lifetime of christian leadership is now in the last stage of his life and um he has uh, invested over the last years a lot of time in learning uh, how to be a coach, how to be a mentor, and how to be a spiritual director. So he's got all three, and his his role now is helping Christian leaders and pastors in order to grow and develop. And it's it's good to have people who are uh, professionally trained and have experience in that area where you can go, especially when you're wanting to make major decisions to have people you really trust. Okay, well, uh, I think our time is is gone, Benjamin. We're, we've uh, yeah. gone slightly over our hour. But thank Ooh. you very much, everybody, for coming along today. You know, just let me encourage you, keep going for it. Uh, be a lifelong learner who's always got their ears and their heart open to new lessons that God might be teaching you and helping you to develop and uh, I wish you every success uh, where where you are now and in the future and building a strong team that you can really rejoice in. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Peter, for your so so good presentation oh, um, and thank God for, for your experience and wisdom and uh, so many application for us. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Peter, again. Thank you.